Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Say Report. I'm Devin Decker, uh, fresh off of an aborted bit, and joining me, my host companion, Sejan Zerwick. How you doing, Sejan? <laughs> doing good. This is good energy to start the show. I'm excited. Let's oh, see. I'm sweatier this. than I want to be right now, is what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, and it's not like flop sweat. It's just, it's hotter in the basement than I thought it was. Should I make this faster, this fan? Nope, it was already oh, no. as fast as it goes. <laughs> uh, right visual humor on this podcast hi everybody welcome to the say report we got stuff to talk about this week you know yeah, it's like i've forgotten right. how to do it you know we're starting off with something beetlejuice beetlejuice comes to theaters on friday uh they're gonna have a lot of problems at a lot of theaters with people ordering their tickets aren't they that that ghost with the most you're gonna show up a bunch well <laughs> bunch of theaters i love one I, from- yeah, the- it's also it's what I I don't unless they make a third one I don't know what the joke is supposed to be exactly with the title like I understand that if you say his name three times he shows up but it's not like he's not in this movie <laughs> imagine what if he's not what if in Beetlejuice Beetlejuice there's no like how do I, if I if I is it, if I pause am I safe now like if I say his name again is he gonna show up. How much time needs to pass between the, the, the sayings of the word? Now, community would have us believe I- infinite time. It doesn't matter, which means that we're all screwed. Because eventually, this, I mean, in this conversation alone. <laughs> He's already showed up. And he has, in fact, already showed up to drop off a Fanta haunted apple soda at my desk. Uh, which I wish I could send the extra one I got. It was buy one, get one free. Through Are to they you. tying it to Beetlejuice? Yeah, it's, or it's, is it like... It's Fanta Beetlejuice Beetlejuice Haunted Apple. In fact, it specifically says a certified Beetlejuice Beetlejuice movie partner. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. I wonder if that means that they drink it in the movie. <laughs> it's a... Michael Keaton just gets a big old glass of Fanta at some point. Oh, you know what makes me feel good, Lydia? A big old glass of Fanta, not a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's an interesting feeling. <laughs> hey, you're lucky I, I didn't start this it? episode with the year is 1993 and you are Rob Reiner. <laughs> <laughs> I just want him to be like. Who likes our soda? And then just pull out a big old bottle of Fanta. <laughs> and then, but in the orange soda is Kel Mitchell. Uh, and actually, it <laughs> says official Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice movie partner, not certified. It's not Rotten Tomatoes. But I wanted to. We've been trying a lot of sodas on the show, so I wanted to try this one on air. Uh, plus, you know, sugar that that always makes me fun to listen to. So I'm taking a I swig say, right I'm- now. And I'm not like there's a reason that we stick to the Mountain Dews when we usually do this because like that is where I'm willing to I don't I don't dive too deep into the soda well nowadays like specialty sodas maybe and even then it I it, like I can't drink too many of them or or like I can't have them too often because like I don't know soda just doesn't do it for me or liquid candy nowadays and like this is not me shitting on soda I'm not one of those like fucking hydro bros out there that's like you got to just stick to water and like it can only be tap um especially in this part of Utah but um but like I I just I can't do soda I just can't do it that often anymore and Fanta is like worst offender for me like if I drink like Fanta especially one of the like faker fruit flavors like I, my stomach just goes on the fucking war path for like the next 24 hours. I hope that doesn't happen to me. I just took a second sip cause I had to. So the description of this is spiced apple soda. It kind of tastes like a caramel apple, but a caramel apple that's ask. gone bad. <laughs> Oops. Like, Oh, we left that caramel apple out in the sun too long. Ho, 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 over. Well, so I was going to say that they like, well, they want to have their caramel apple and then eat it too. Right. Because they're putting this Beetlejuice one version out now. And then you have to assume that they're hoping that they can keep the, like the tail going through Halloween season. Right. Like even maybe Thanksgiving, like they can keep sticking to the spiced apple Fanta for the holiday season. Right. But I think it's going to be Beetlejuice coated the entire time. <laughs> oh, sure. oh no, of they're course. Like... But, but, 
what matters to them is that it's the flavor profile they can justify keeping it on the shelf because now it's just a fall flavor right and then like beetlejuice just gets the better end of that deal because they just get to be they just get the the advertising for the longer time right yeah and they have all the characters on cans of fanta like you can buy a Lydia Dietz branded Fanta twelve pack. Uh, there's one with Catherine O'Hara on it, uh, which I have thoughts about her in the movie. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I'm seeing the movie this week. Um, I gotta tell you, oh, I'm I, excited too. Yeah, like I'm excited to see it too. But I've never been a huge Beetlejuice fan. I like okay. in the first movie. I'm a real big fan of what Gina Davis is doing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I don't think she's gonna be in Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. No, I don't. don't I do not believe that Gina Davis and, and Alec Baldwin are in this this one. Right. Um, for for a multitude of reasons. I, uh, <laughs> Least but, of uh, all, they died in the first movie, Devin. Um, which <laughs> that's actually the uh, start of the oh, film. <laughs> sure. I mean, like, like as as somebody that does consider themselves like a fan of the of the franchise, I will say because I also love the cartoon show and. and I think I even have a couple of Beetlejuice comics um, that were cartoon show related. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but like I I don't know I mean I I dig it. it it is it is the best it's one of the best forms of of Tim Burton filmmaking out there. There are some there are some versions of Tim Burton filmmaking that I would not recommend to people that are like wanting to get introduced to him. Um, but this is Beetlejuice is definitely one of the top ones yeah. in that regard. Not to spoil the pot, but what is one you would not recommend? I'm curious. Uh, Dark Shadows is probably kind of bottom of the list. I, I and this is as somebody that even enjoyed that movie, but like uh, Miss Peregrine's the the other the other one he did with uh, uh, uh Miss Peregrine's uh, Home for Peculiar Children. Yeah, yeah, I like and, that, and movie that was a because lot. I love that. I, 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 the movie is okay. I had a hard time because I came at it as the as book a fan of the book, issue. and I totally like, get and then that. like the series, like the whole like basically the way that they changed things in that movie. If I'm remembering correctly, because I also haven't seen it since the first time I saw it, but they made some changes in the plot of that movie and some characters that basically meant there was no way they could do other stories in that, that yes, series. That is so it was just that like, is correct. Dis- yeah, so it's just like this is. This is great. I will never get you'll never get to some of the best parts of the story slash the best best growths of these characters. Yeah. So so like I had some issues in that regard with that movie. But also on top of that, I also don't find them very Tim Burton in a lot of what he's doing in the, in those movies. It, 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 you know, I I could I could definitely see the argument for some stuff going on especially in Dark Shadows like the the sex scene between um the between the two leads there um uh, Johnny De- is it Eva I keep wanting to say Eva Mendes but it's not Eva Mendes it's Eva Green. Eva Green. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, Eva Green and uh, and Johnny Depp uh, have a have a scene in that movie that is very over the top uh, silly and that is like it is a moment that is so Tim Burton-y that it makes you kind of realize how un-Tim Burton-y the rest of the movie is. Um, no, but, like, I would throw, I mean, I would throw that, uh, I mean, I would throw Beetlejuice up there, obviously, Edward Scissorhands, you know, and he's the, he did Big Fish, right? Big he Fish did do his, Big right? Fish. So that's an interesting thing, because I was going to say, the two that you mentioned, Dark Shadows and Miss Peregrine, they are the most adaptations that Tim Burton mm-hmm. has ever directed uh, dark shadows of being of the television program that had a thousand and 53 episodes. It's either a thousand and 53 or a thousand and 43 episodes. You can buy the complete. I think we might've done this on the show. Uh, you can buy the complete DVD set of dark shadows. It's like 300 discs. Mm-hmm. It's an insane amount of discs. I mean, for anybody that does, I, if we, it was a soap opera, it was, a soap opera. It was on every, episodes. yeah, it was it was on every day. It was easy to produce. They used a lot of the same sets. The stories really didn't go anywhere or do much. It, you know, and it, like eventually they did. You just had to watch fifteen episodes worth to get anywhere. Like so, that's why there's so many episodes of it. Is that it was a daily um, soap opera that just happened to be about werewolves and vampires. <laughs> um, it was rad. It was rad. It was, rad. Rad. I, it was I really cool. Watching it on BBC, PBS when I was growing up and shit. My mother loves it. It's one of my mom's favorite shows, and I like to think that it paved the way for her to be a soap opera fan. Um, which yeah. that's it's weird that we don't really have soap operas anymore, isn't it? Yeah, they're all on. But stream. in terms Sorry, of adaptation in Tim Burton, yeah, I will say that I will always recommend Batman. Wait. Um, although interestingly, I think if I were to say as a Tim Burton person, you should probably watch Batman Returns, which infamously was more Tim, more Tim Burton than yeah. Batman. <laughs> yeah, but but I would definitely put Batman up there as one right. that you got to watch. Eventually. But no, but like, like but those I, two I, there. But then two Tim Burton movies that I would recommend, like in a second, would be Batman '89. And something like Big Fish, 
because yeah, he, fish. yeah, because Big Fish is a book, right? I wouldn't read the book Big Fish, but I would watch the movie, even though I don't even know. I, you know, that's that's that's. I wouldn't be surprised, I guess, but I actually honestly was not aware of that. If it's based it on the 1998 novel Big Fish, a novel of mythic proportions. Mm. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, uh, yeah, so it's not even a matter of, like, oh, it needs to be his ideas or something like that. Like, I just, I think that there's there's some movies that Tim Burton has done where it feels like maybe he um, has given up or maybe is, like, willing. It, it's, the, it's more like the James Patterson effect where, like, <laughs> James Patterson doesn't have to do anything nowadays except just keep writing like James Patterson. Or, I, I mean, I'll even, we'll, we'll throw this even at, like, somebody like Stephen King. Right. Like somebody who is extremely successful and somebody that I have talked about admiring and like I have books by him on writing. I know there are books by Stephen King where he is just on autopilot. And that's what it is. Right. Is that there are certain movies that Tim Burton has done over the years that are very much just Tim Burton on autopilot, or at least it feels like that from this side watching. Whereas you don't really see him taking like chances and trying something wild and wacky and going over the top or like doing something that really kind of blows you away that you've never seen before. Like that just hasn't happened in a while in a Tim Burton movie for me. Um, you know, I, I mean, I would point to even like the first Alice in Wonderland that he did as the, having a couple of moments in, in that that really kind of got me that I was really impressed by when he was really kind of digging into CGI use for the first time and stuff like that. Like and and so I I do think he does still have it in him. So that's why I'm excited about Beetlejuice is like, or Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, I should say, because like, I, <laughs> you um, just said it three I, times. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is how they got you, right? Is that they always, they, they knew everybody was going to just call it Beetlejuice at first and then realize I actually do have to correct myself because there is another, <laughs> you just named that. <laughs> you know what? You know what? That's the end game. Right, to, to be there is that eventually they're hoping that they can do double features of Beetlejuice and Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, and boom, yeah. then there's Beetlejuice. Because I, I have to go to like go back to my original like half joke of that started this whole thing. Yeah, I cannot imagine they think they're ever going to do a third one. I can't At least believe if they're they doing think a third one's ever going to happen. It's not going to be. It's not right, right? <laughs> like part of the reason why I'm seeing this film is it is a film my entire life people have been talking about a sequel to Beetlejuice and it yeah although really... for a long time it was supposed to be Beetlejuice in Paradise right like, Beetlejuice goes weird... Hawaiian <laughs> yeah or whatever yeah whatever weird like wacky title they were gonna give it because I, I I don't know and like if that is one of those jokes that sounds so true because like the idea of Tim Burton wanting to take the concepts of Beetlejuice and then put it into a tropical paradise with like the vibrant colors and like all of the different odd shapes that you can get in nature out in those places and stuff like it feels like Tim Burton would have it would be a, a literal sandbox for him right <laughs> like like it feels like that yeah actually that makes sense so like it was very easy to believe those rumors whenever those popped up um, but you're not wrong, man. I, I mean, like, I've been hearing it ever since I've been scouring the internet looking at movie news. Ever since I was, like, 10 or 12 years old and, like, discovered that people talked about movies on the internet. One of the stories that's always been out there is Tim Burton working on Beetlejuice sequel. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those things that's always kind of been out there in the water. Uh, and also, I think he goes Hawaiian because of all the Calypso music that was repopularized by yeah, Beetlejuice. Yeah. So it was like this weird logical leap to go to. Um, so this is one of those films that like, I never thought we were going to ever get. And yet here yeah. it is. I had completely forgotten about the Tim Burton of it also. Thank you for reminding me of that. God, I feel like a dang fool. Um, but also it was an excuse to test out this vibrant green soda that doesn't taste like someone said this tasted like vomit. It doesn't taste like vomit. It tastes like green apples. Specifically, I will say they, they distilled the flavor of a green apple as opposed to a red apple. I feel like an idiot, the words that I just said. And I think that green apples have that like a little bit of bitterness to them, right? Like they're baking apples because you're going to add sugar and everything. So you don't want like a honey crisp because then you, it'll be too sweet once you add the sugar and everything with it. Like green Granny apples. Smiths are traditionally green. Green Smiths are traditionally uh, green, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, like uh, green apples also are more on the sour side as well. Not yeah. just, um, uh, not just bitter or, bitter. or less sweet, but um, but also more sour often, right? Yes. So I mean, it's tasty. It's an interesting thing. But initially, like it was a weird kind of like, oh, that was excitingly weird in my stomach. But I'd like to pivot 
from you mentioning learning about movies on the on the the TV on the internet. Oh, I'm an idiot. What the fuck am I doing? Excuse me. Um, because it was 12th grade with the current head of the English department at my high school that I learned about IMDb, and I would like to address something that I saw from my my high school English department uh, just this past week. If you'll indulge me, Sejan, uh, you could say no, and we will totally abandon what I'm talking about. But I'd like to Just, show you, you a photo. You, you weren't like skulking around the high school. No, right? I like, wasn't. It was like, on. Okay. It was on social media that they shared this photo that I am currently sharing with you. I'm putting it in the Discord so that everybody can look at it and go and go. What? Because there's this is the photo of the English department staff that my high school English department proudly shared on on Facebook and that it currently has at least 151 likes and loves but I would like to focus more on the quote above the teachers oh um, oh okay uh, is that on the wall or is that transposed in the picture I believe like on that's the on the wall lighting. And I have a bit of a problem with that being on the wall of my high school. And as the guy who historically broke into my high school after hours to paint over a mural that I found offensive, uh, and that literally raised zero issue or complaints. As far as I know, nobody got mad at me for that mural getting painted over. Um, And... Dale, she's like, what mural are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, that's right. We painted over it before you were a student at the high school. So you <laughs> wouldn't know about it. Um, I kind of want to ba- break out the paints and break back in and paint over that. Like, first of all, I have a bit of an issue with that particular quote. Uh, even before you, you we know who said the quote. it. Yeah. Do you want to explain what's going on so that we're not just yeah. like No, that's fine. That's fine. Um edging edging the audience. We're not edging. you have to join the Discord to see it. No, I'll I'll talk about what the quote says. Um it says if you don't like to read, you haven't found the right book. Which I just I disagree with that logic in a in a lot of ways. Um but also I really disagree with who said it. And that's JK Rowling. Noted hate monger in the year 2024. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Notable shithead, J.K. Rowling, yeah. yeah. Um, who seems to take real issue with everybody else using, uh, deciding to change their identity to feel more safe and protected, um, despite the fact that she has twice named herself after male names in her writing career because, in her own words, so that I could get published. <laughs> yeah... Um, and I don't oh, want to. I don't want to give any more time to this than is necessary. I especially don't want to give any time to her. No, um, what I want to talk about then. Well, no, you finish your thought here. No, but I have. Just... I have a thought about this picture that I have questions about. <laughs> oh, that's. I'd love to to go deeper into the bit. I just have an issue with that, like being in a like high schools are hard enough, but then when like that kind of feels like that building is already against certain members of the population. And I guess to go one step further, you know what? I'm actually now fury has grown in my stomach. It might be the Fanta. It's not the Fanta. It is facts. It is facts about my fucking life. Uh, freshman year for this talent show, me and a friend put together an act. Uh, she was a female piano player. I was a singer. Uh, we put together an act where she would dress in traditionally masculine clothes. I would dress in traditionally feminine clothes. She would play the piano, and I would sing I'm Just Wild About Harry. And it was good. We put in time to put together this act. And on the day, I auditioned, and they stopped me before I could even get through, like, two lines of the song saying this would be offensive to anybody in school who cross-dresses. And, like, on level one, what if I am somebody in the school who cross-dresses? Aren't you telling me that I can't be the person I want to be on the stage? Isn't that being offensive as well? And I'm saying I'm not, right? I'm not not that type of person. But, like, weird to think of these fictional people who might be out there offended by this act and not the person who's willing to wear traditionally feminine clothing uh, in front of the entire student body. And, and take whatever comes from that, right? But then to think yeah. that, like, 
that was their issue. But now, at that same school, uh, I'm going to say 23 years later, they have up a quote from somebody who is totally against, like, trans people in general. Like, that really feels like they're telling me what I should have realized back when I was a freshman. Now I'm mad. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the teaching moment the teaching moment for, for then, right? And it's not even necessarily, like, one that, like, requires one. But, like, the question that should be asked is, what is the bit here? Right? Is this, is this something that you're doing as a show of support for this community? Or is there supposed to be some humor found just in the idea that it's funny when people wear clothes they're not supposed to? Because that's problematic, right? But if the idea is, like, you are doing this as, like, a form of solidarity for this whole, like, thing, then fine. Like, like then that's, that's a conversation to be had. But not having that conversation is a big mistake, right? Right. No and conversation. It was just, to the quote, no, you can't do I this. I have to imagine they didn't put it up, like, recently, right? I would have to imagine that that's been up for a while. It was not there when I graduated 20 years ago. Well, right, so, but it wouldn't have been, right? Because Harry Potter was not the the I mean, it kind of was. upon billions dollar franchise. But it when I was in was. high school, we were only on book six. Uh, no, and book the movies f- had only just started. Uh, I mean, book six came out when we were in college. No, yeah, no. Okay, more yeah, than my point. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a point there, and I understand that, but it's like... <laughs> I don't know. It seems just very like, here's the thing. Even if that went up in 2005, right mm-hmm. after, after I'm gone and then they decide we're going to put this up on the wall. Um, why would you in 2024 take your photo in front of it? Yes. Like, like there, the there's the problem that I have with it. It's just like, Oh, we didn't really think about that. Like, it just makes me, it makes me hate my fucking high school. And I know that I just, like, had a little bit of a diatribe about the high school reunion that, like, I don't have any fucking desire to go back to. But, like, this is kind of, like, signed, sealed, delivered, fuck you to my high school. That, like, this is what they're they're taking their photo in front of. And this, even this if... Is, this is one of the reasons why you find yourself in a position to not want to go back and relive that time, right? Right. I mean, like... I mean, honestly, I'm pretty much happy wherever I go. I'm going to try to have a good time. So even if I had gone, I bet I could have found fun. Though I also imagine that I might have been one of those people who like, all right, an hour was enough to see what life was like 20 years ago. Peace out. <laughs> and then go do something I actually enjoy. As opposed Let's to the- go smoke on the roof and then go out and get some B- <laughs> BK. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but now here's my thing. So yeah, please bring me your thing. We ochres are? Is that proper English? I mean, that's weird for the ochres, because it's we are ochres, but that def- those shirts definitely say we ochres are. Yeah, there's not a... It's not... Like, this. the, the style is not an excuse for the fact that, that those blatantly just are the words we ochres are in a row. Just because ochres is in a different font doesn't magically mean I will read that after I read the rest. Gotta read all of the big, bold, white letters first before I can go back and read the stylized red letters. Also... <laughs> that's not how... That's, <laughs> what did you get? That's not how the hierarchy of design works. Like, that's just not... <laughs> Alright, now at this point, I think we're cyberbullying my high school, my former high school's <laughs> English department. Though you're not wrong. For an I English department... Out. I wouldn't be shitty about it if we were talking about the fact that this is an English department and they didn't seem to give a shit about the quote about books because of the ways in which that probably rubs certain kids. Like, not, when I say rub kids the wrong way, I don't mean just makes them angry. I mean, literally, like, scares them into not wanting to participate in the community because they are just, like, feeling like everybody else around them are big readers. So they there's something must be wrong with them oh, because I must that be- is not a thing that they enjoy. <laughs> Right, like that's a shitty th- way, like attitude to put out in the world. Yeah, Putting even if you deny the J.K. The JK Rowling do. part of it, if you don't like right. to read, you haven't found the right book. That's real reader exclusion, right there. Right, like this, like oh, you just haven't found the right book, you piece I, of shit. Like you know, what the I hell? I would say that as an English department, like having to kind of promote that idea that like reading is necessary and it is like i'm not going to sit here and act like it's not as somebody that reads as somebody that believes that like you should be reading books in order to gain knowledge and stuff like i'm all for that but to at a time when a kid is impressionable set up a line in the sand essentially (laughs) 
<laughs> is a really shitty way to approach getting somebody to like a subject. It's a shitty way to do it in general, right? Like, y y like to make this about like a less about like kids at high school stuff, but just to, like life. Like, it's when when somebody says, "I don't like Mexican food," or "I'm I'm not big on Chinese food." And all anybody ever wants to say is, oh, you haven't found the right restaurant yet. You haven't found the right recipe or the, fight, the right You haven't found the, the right, right dish. dish and it's just like, no, there's just something about this particular style of food and cooking that just isn't something that I enjoy. And it is not detrimental to my life otherwise, so I don't engage with it, right? Or I don't like this kind of movie. Oh, well, you just haven't watched the right one in that genre yet. Or you haven't, you know, some people just straight up just don't like movies. People just don't like music. Some people are just like, I, I don't do know. If, if, if you don't like movies, you probably just haven't seen the right movie. Yeah, do you hear it? <laughs> do you hear how fucking exclude? Like, fuck you. Like, no, you're gonna like this thing I like. You just have to find one that you like. No, I don't think that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. See, instead of I, I wonder, like, if this is one of those things where, like, what we really need to do moving forward because of the ways that, like, film, television, video games have all kind of changed the landscape of the ways in which we take in information and learn. Like, if it's not a matter of, like, schools needing English departments anymore, but literacy departments. Right. And then in that case, you can teach things like media liter literacy in addition to like yes we want you to read books but also we should consider the fact that where you're getting a lot of your information now is youtube like we should we should have <laughs> we should be teaching kids the ability to parse out bullshit and nonsense in their viewing of movies and film and youtube and social media as well as right the same ways that we reach we teach critically about how to read books and get the right things out of them but leave certain things behind like yes we read to kill a mockingbird even though it uses the bad language but it's because we understand what this book is trying to say it imparts this like it, it you know it uses this style it uses this stuff that others would find offensive but it's important for us to still engage with that we should be applying that same fucking logic to like gangs in New York, right? Like, like there's, there's all sorts of things, like all sorts of things that we should be teaching kids to quote unquote read nowadays, not just books. Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting because like a math department, you don't take four years of math. You take a year of algebra, a year of geography, and then other specialized thing, maybe like a pre calculus yeah, ge Geometry. Geometry, you're taking sorry. geography in your math courses. Sorry, I you're... mean, I guess if you're out there learning to be a navigator for the sea. <laughs> right, I'm sorry, geometry. But I, I'm, I'm pas passionate right here, right? But you do, right? Like, you take specializations. Your science courses, like, you might start with, like, a general science course, but then you spin off into specializations like biology and chemistry and physics or forensic. Like Dale took a forensic class. The history right. department has kind of evolved, even as well, when I was back in school, to more of a social studies department. And not just like social studies course, but, you know, psychology was a course you could take instead of a history course, like my junior year. Or we did civics of like the 1900 to 1950s was like one semester, and then the next semester was 1950 to 19, yeah. uh, 1990. You know, at that point we were only in 2000 something, so that made sense. Right. Um, but like, yeah, but we, we did like civics courses in addition to history courses in addition to um, world religion was a was a like was yeah, a course. that. But they're all under like the same banner. But the English department, you essentially take four years of English. And like one of my issues is I'm like, these are the same things I've like my junior year. I'm like, I'm tired of this just being the same crap. Like I've yeah. had three years think, of the like, same was, like, crap. Yeah, the way the way that they like divvy that kind of stuff up, or at least back when we were in high school, was stuff like there was like a novels class that you could read where you were like reading like great American novels or something, and there was like another class where they were doing drama. Like and and even then though, you had to get to those class like those were higher level courses. First, you needed to complete like you know two three years of English and then get into like an AP class if you wanted to take the drama one or the poetry class. When and even those weren't even full years. I I think that it was like novels was the first half of the year. And then um, I think our AP writing was the second half of the year. And it was, it was, yeah, it was uh, wild the way that they split that stuff up, but it was all still just like word on page, like literature was yeah. the, was the focus. Right. And I mean, like my first three years of high school, it was all American, like literature. It was all American novels. And then my senior year, we finally got into like British literature 
as like the focus. And now I mean, I've already, I don't want to relive how bad that class was for me to the point where the teacher's like, I'm sorry I had to send you to the principal's office, but like you were on a different level than the rest of the class. So like it was easier to remove the distraction so that I could teach easier. She's in that photo, by the way. She's now the head of the English department, which that's just fun to think about, right? I'll just remove the distracting student. Um, and it's not like I was being rude. I was just like, oh, you want to talk about this book that we had to read? Here's what I noticed in it. Go to the principal's office. Okay. <laughs> but, like, you're not wrong. Like, it would make more sense if we changed English departments into more of a like a literacy department and you took a year of how to parse out videos, how to lay it's yeah. cause I'm like, <clears throat> I, I ironic for what I'm going to talk about after this whole weird opening session of things that made me upset. Um, but I, I, I don't read as much as I used to, but that's not true. I don't read novels as much as I used to. I read the internet constantly. I'll read entire Wikipedia entries. I will read blog posts. I will read reviews. I'll read like, like I still read. I just don't read novels. And it's one of those things that like, I have to be like, yeah, you still read. You just don't read the way that, like, we read for 150 years, 200 years. It's not like I've stopped reading. So I, I can't be upset with that. It's just I don't find the experience of reading a novel the same, it, yeah. like, level of enjoyment that I used to. And on some level... That makes sense because a novel, you kind of have to have the right lighting. You kind of have to have a place where like you're comfortable enough to hold that novel and like be able to read. And I, 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 time. Yeah. Yeah. Like time is a huge factor in that regard for a lot of people. Like we can give people all the shit in the world they want about like listening to audiobooks as opposed to like reading them. But the ways in which that has allowed people to engage with works of literature and get their shit done and like in a time when everybody's got a fucking side hustle going like like we yeah that's kind of the way we need to to, to move to in order to still engage with these works like yeah no I, the, the the way in which we consume stories is really what those departments should have been more about and like what those stories are teaching us and trying to tell us and how they shape us and how we need to learn like how where the dangerous stuff is and what to do and how to handle the dangerous stuff when we get to it like that's what those departments should be about the idea that they're still just like teaching kids like this is Romeo and Juliet and like at the end of the day here's what irony means and it's just like <laughs> That's like at some point, all that's gonna do for you is teach you that like Alanis Morissette doesn't know how to <laughs> how to parse out irony. Like that's the only thing I have learned from Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> right? And yet, because of that song, I, Ben Affleck is it? He he wrote it in a foreword to one of like Kevin Smith comic collections. Like there is now exists a type of irony in the sense that Alanis Morissette meant it because of the the stranglehold that song had on the collective cultural conscience. So like, mm -hmm. in addition to teaching us what real irony is, right? Words and phrases being used in ways other than their actual meaning. I'm trying to think of how Bender sings it in the devil's hands or idle play things. Uh, the, the, the best way I've ever episode. heard it described is that if you imagine it from like a play standpoint, it's the audience knowing something that the characters on stage don't. That, that That is when you are in the realm of irony, is when you start to exist in a world in which the audience is aware of something and, and that the that that the people on stage don't and you just kind of have to watch it like a train wreck happen in slow motion because of it, right? Is like, that's when you have noticed that something is ironic. And like, that was explained through Romeo and Juliet in like The Poisoning, right? Yes. Where, where she uh, has faked her death and Romeo... Wait, wait, right? Romeo's yeah. faked his death. And she, she fakes and her death. About she fakes her death, so Romeo kills himself to be with her. Right, right. Yeah, and then yeah, she yeah. kills so herself. So in that moment, yeah. there's this uh, there's this dramatic irony of you realizing as the audience, oh, she's not dead, and it's like, oh, no, what's going to happen? And, yeah, it's it, it's this, like... So, like, that is... That's what that's the one thing I remember about this. I mean, that I is... I couldn't tell you much fuck all else about anything else I did in high school English. <laughs> To quote, so I'm currently on uh, Google. I've Googled irony, 
right? And uh, these definitions are from Oxford languages. Well, it's, yeah, and there are three definitions. The first, the expression of one's meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite, typically right. for humorous or emphatic effect. So that's the first definition. The second definition, a state of affairs or an event that seems deliberately contrary to what one expects and is often amusing as a result. So that's like the like Atlantis rain on your wedding day. Yeah, right. It's a black <laughs> fly in your Chardonnay. Who would have thought? It figures. Um, a free and then, ride when you've already paid. Which, that, that, I hate that one. <laughs> that one upsets me. It's a 10,000 spoons when all you need is a knife. Um, but then the final definition, and then there's Seymour. But these are the three, Seymour, S-E-E space M-O-R-E, not the guy. Seymour is not in the house. Um, which is your definition of a literary... Explain underneath to me, Seymour. <laughs> Teach me, Seymour. <laughs> um, it's a literary technique originally used in Greek tragedy by which the full significance of a character's words or actions are clear to the audience or reader, although unknown to the character. So like mm-hmm. the definition you give, right? And then like, there's all sorts of stuff, but it's like, we need to make sure that we understand the different levels of irony because irony has become so like metamorphosized in the modern meta that it, so how many people, how many English courses throughout this country do you think are talking about Alanis Morissette? I would, I would hope There's all of them, right? I, I would hope that, like, if you're doing a section on irony, right? Like, I feel like you have to cover all three of those definitions. If not, like, there's this picture that's, like, five tips for teaching irony. Oh, I am copying this photo and popping it up into the thing. Our Discord is insane. Join our Discord. Um, like, <laughs> when you take the elevator to get to the gym. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know. Irony's a weird thing. And, like, even then. Isn't that I a Mitch don't... Hedberg joke? <laughs> Talking about the escalator. Isn't that the Mitch Hedberg? No, no, no. I, no. I might be thinking the, the Mitch Hedberg, Hedberg joke is. Part of it. Escalator currently stairs. No, Sorry no, for the but convenience. There's a, no, but there's there's some <laughs> comedian that has a joke about the escalator leading to the curves, like like that being the the like setup. Every time you see a curves, it's always at the top of an escalator. Like is is like the, the punchline. And I'm trying to remember who said that. Probably some asshole that I probably shouldn't be quoting. But there you go. Yeah, but I mean that's that's the world, right? I mean that's if this episode had a title, and it does, but it's probably not. Some asshole I shouldn't be quoting. I don't know if that's what we're going to call this episode. But, like, yeah, I don't know. I was really, like, I was scrolling through my phone, and I saw that photo, and I'm like, that's enough internet for me today. That real <laughs> irony is we now know that what we're referring to is that quote I just said, but anybody that only listens to the first few minutes of this podcast will just assume we just, we were attributing that to J.K. Rowling. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, right? It's it's just all around the mulberry bush. The monkey chasing the weasel. <sighs> so, I mean, I so guess... So, is there something else you wanted to talk about besides your high school this week? <laughs> no, I mean, there's so many things. I was so excited, but this was just like... I wanted to get all the nasty stuff out of the way first and then talk about happy things. So, I guess my attempt to transla- transfer segue into that is... I have been up since 5 o'clock this morning. Do you know what I did... For those six hours before we recorded, I will admit one hour of it was breakfast out at a lovely little diner. Um, so, so I only did it for five hours. Oh. Well, I was going to say maybe Vampire Survivors, but you showed me that platinum three days ago. So Yes, and we'll talk about my 18-hour Vampire Survivors stream in a little bit. Uh, I like a little movie called Hackers. Uh, we talked about it on the show that year that I watched Hackers every Friday for a year. Um, and we're eventually going to do an episode on hackers, but this morning I was up at five and like, couldn't sleep. So I'm just like scrolling through the internet and someone mentions the fact that in the movie hackers, Dade is given Dade Murphy, the main character played by Eli Stone. Oh my God. What's his name? Johnny Lee Miller played by Johnny Lee Miller is gifted a laptop by the villain of the piece. Um, Eugene the Plague Belford, played by Fisher Stevens, not in Brownface, right? I feel like we should point out every movie where he's not 
a horrendous cultural appropriation stereotype that has aged poorly. Um, also, I'm pretty sure AI <laughs> would have problems with short circuit uh, outside of the brown face of it all. But yes, um, so Fisher Stevens in it, and he sends him this laptop, and somebody in this hackers group that I sometimes get posts from was like, it's so weird that like he sends him the laptop and he uses the laptop without any fear of like spyware or malware. And first of all, he doesn't. Like he doesn't use the laptop <laughs> once he receives the <laughs> laptop. He still uses his old like one that he spray painted with camo or he uses other computers. He uses it one time when he receives a call to like set your computer to receive a file from me like he gets it but then someone else mentioned uh, they, they actually really address it better in the novelization and that was when I realized that there's a novelization of the movie hackers so I went to Amazon and I went to buy a copy of it and it was $180 Whoa. soft cover hard cover it is $333 so then, it's a book about hacking. So I'm like, I bet somebody put this online as a PDF. And I found it. I found it through Scribed. Um, I don't know the legality of the website Scribed, but I signed up for a free account, and I s spent most of this morning between doing other th chores and things, reading the first ch 10 chapters of the novelization of Hackers. <laughs> and this is good. Like, it's real good. Um, it, it brings a lot of depth to it. Um, that Clearly, it is a guy adapting from the screenplay, and he makes some pretty big mistakes. Like, Lord Nikon, one of the hacker gang, um, has a photographic memory, hence his handle, Lord Nikon. You know, the camera company. But in the novelization, the Phantom Freak, who is a phone hacker, freaking... Uh, they give him the photographic memory, and it's just like, mm. well, that that's a problem. And in just this one chapter, they're like, they go to a party, which they found out about via hacking, but then they're like, oh, yeah, we're at Kate's party. And it's like, so were you invited to this party that your friend was throwing, or did you go through the internet and find out a part about a party and crash it? Like... And that's, like, within the same page of text that it goes yeah. from they hacked, they found about out about this party online, and then we have to go say hi to the hostess. So, 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 um, Biscoff or Bish, Bischoff, I don't know how you say his last name, David, David, um, Bischoff, I will yeah. say, um, he, uh, this is, this is kind of his bag is he does, um, he, he, he does novelizations and stories in existing ips he has a yeah. he has a bunch of books that are also like his own original stuff too and has he's done like short stories and stuff but his bread and butter is clearly this right like looking at his like his his uh, uh repertoire you got like gremlins 2 the new batch vamp uh, up here right but but the reason i know him is i actually right now have star trek books in this house that he wrote and i'm pretty sure one or two of them at least are like original stories i don't remember them being next gen episodes but I, I i also next gen is one of those series that like i can watch a million times and i forget whole swaths of because there's just so much going on in that show um apparently but, my uh, only yeah, so like, episode of star trek the next generation that i like is a universally hated episode of gener of next generation which one which one you, which, they go to that? like they go to like a spa planet <laughs> Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, that and like, happens more than once. But uh... yeah, but it was a spot plan one, and I'm like, oh, this is really engaging. And the person, like, I'm like, I really enjoyed that. And the person who showed me the episode is like, people hate that episode of the show. And I'm like, why? <laughs> that was enjoyable. It was different. They weren't on the ship. And I know the character. I have to imagine that hating an episode of Next Generation is still pretty high praise compared to how stump check fans feel about other aspects of that entire That's franchise. That's fair. Yeah. Um, but the, so, so this is not like, this is not like new to him, like being handed a script and turning it into a novel. You say mistakes that the writer is making. What I, what I'm getting at is 
I also have to wonder how many iterations back in a script he was given the story to then turn into a novelization, right? Because that is also something that infamously happens in this particular market, is that books get get written based on pre-versions of scripts where characters that weren't even in the movie show up, entire scenes from the movie that never end up making it on screen end up in the books and people like, like and then and then the canonicity of that stuff always becomes, becomes part of the question. I remember the, um, the X-Files books had a lot of stuff that people were like really like up in arms about like back in the day like in my circles you know nowadays it's even worse because i cannot imagine what it would be like being in a community well i do know what it's like because this is what goes on with the five nights at freddy's community is there's this huge thing right now where there are now they've the the community for five nights at freddy's has kind of come to the realization that there's actually been more written work than video games in that world and so for years, there's always been this kind of argument in the group about like, oh, are the books even worth paying attention to? They don't really like they're they're changing story stuff, much like what you're talking about. Things are happening to characters that don't happen in the games and stuff like that. So like this cannot be true. But now when there's more book than there is video game, people are like, oh, no, like, what do we have to kind canon? of ad yeah. adapt? Right. Adapt that this is the canon now and that the video games are the ones that are maybe off. And like, no, it can all be part of the fun, guys. You don't have to have that. Like, it's not like a like a deep philosophical. Like, we don't you, need right? that. There are some people who need that in order to enjoy things who like need well, to know what is so the back true to canon. hackers. Right. Yeah. It's like it sounds like you're still enjoying your time oh, with hackers, the novel, <laughs> enjoying the crap out of it. But interestingly enough, the book was published July 11th of 1995. The movie is not released until September 15th of 1995. So that, oh, that is, is interesting. What is also interesting is that the cover of hackers, the novel says now a major motion picture from United Artists, which makes it sound like this was an existing book that we've no, now adapted that's marketing into bullshit. a script. Yeah, it's... Yeah, that is marketing <laughs> bullshit. Because then it. it also says that based on the the screenplay by... <laughs> by uh, Raphael Moreau. So it's yeah. just like, it's all sorts of messing with you. But I really like that now a major motion picture. And... And I will say, like, one of the other huge changes is Jesse Bradford's character, Joey Pardillo, in the film, is named Joey Hardcastle in the novel. And, like, <laughs> I imagine that he had a, like, so the script just didn't have a last name for him. Everybody else is the same. <laughs> They haven't given Lord Nikon's non-hacker name yet, so I don't know if he's going to be Paul. Oh, I can't think of his his actual last name. I feel like a bad hackers fan right now. Um, but I I, I, I don't watch hackers again. Yeah, I, well, I I actually I just watched hackers two Fridays ago, uh, and I invented a new meta for myself. Usually, when I have the movie hackers on, I I I do a Legend of Zelda um, randomizer, Link to the Past randomizer. Um, but I only had an hour to, like, watch Hackers. So I put Hackers on at double speed. So the 100-minute the movie became, like, 50 minutes long. And then I also tried to complete a randomizer of Link to the Past, specifically a Triforce hunt, before the movie ended. So I put that at double speed as well. <laughs> yeah, I had nice. a blast. I, uh, I think that might be how I do it from now on. I just blew everybody's mind at work because I've been going through some some training for uh, for a higher position recently, and uh -huh. um, they give you like three days to like go through the trainings. But the trainings are just a bunch of videos that you can watch at double speed, and that's actually the way that I prefer to watch it. Not to get too deep into some things, but Utahns talk slow. Um, just to, to to throw that out there, anybody that kind of <laughs> understands like the culture out here knows what I mean by that. Yeah. Um, they're they're literally taught to speak in a certain way at like Mormon seminary and stuff, and so like so like it leads to a pattern that is unbearably slow sometimes when people are explaining things and so like i have watched every video i've ever done out here as far as a training video i have had to watch at double speed so that it sounds somewhat tolerable to me um but anyway um so i got through everything in in about a day essentially like because the other thing is that you're supposed to take your time on these tests and they give you like an hour but the tests also are like three questions long it's really it, so like i just got through it all and i was like so what do i do for the next couple of days because like i was like i'm like i, I thought there was more like to do like we'd be like teaming up with people and like 
training like hands on no they were just like what you're done already and i was like yeah i watched the videos i passed the test like, like let's do this thing like what what's the next step and they're like there isn't a next step <laughs> so so i just like it, it it was a little weird because they didn't really like have me set up like equipment wise to just jump into the job and so like it led to like some some back and forth where it was just like i guess you could just kind of re-watch some stuff if you feel like you need to get caught up on things and i was like i don't Want to, but let's pretend that I am. Let's just do that. <laughs> that was like when I worked at the bank and they're like, so the next three days you're going to be doing training courses online. And I finished all the training courses before lunch that day. And they're like, what, what do you mean you finished all the training courses? I'm like, well, like there, it's a reading and then a quiz. I, I just kept doing them. And I mean, I, I thought that that was just like the ones for this morning and then you'd load up more. And they're like, right, no, exactly. that, that's all of them. And I'm like, oh. And then, like, the the manager, like, the president of the bank was super impressed with me. I mean, I ended up walking off of that job uh, my third day out at a branch because the manager's like, so are you excited to start selling for us? And I just said, no. <laughs> and he goes, excuse me? And I go, no, like, I, I don't want to do this job. Should I leave? <laughs> and, he's, and he's like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. And I left. Oh, and I'm just like, man. it was just one of those moments where, like, I, uh, most of my life I have had to learn for, to, like, have my mind be faster than my mouth because my mouth is a bastard. My mouth will speak for me before I can think a, a lot of times. I think it's called yeah. instinct. Um, I instinct respond a lot. And, like, I've learned to, like, not do that. But in that one moment, like, him being so excited and, like, are you excited to start selling for us? No. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. No, no, no is the answer. Like, once my brain caught up, it's like, no, you're not excited. Like, that's why we let mouth take it, Devin. <laughs> I also yeah. love that I talk to, like, like Homer The trick Simpson. of this shit is, like, yeah. it's not that I'm not, I like, it's not that I am, like, Superman and, like, oh, I can listen to things at twice speed. It's just that... I come from New England. People talk faster than mm -hmm. they do in Utah. I perhaps maybe faster in general. So, like, I listen to a lot of things at d double speed. I listen to our own show at double I speed. I love listening to our show I'm, at double like, speed. It is so and much like, fun. Well, and, and, like, the technology in that regard has gotten really good because a lot more – it's not so much about speeding up what's being said so much as just removing the moments where not much is, right? So you get a lot of, like like – the the space between words is disappearing not so much the speed in which words are being said that is also happening but like right. it, it's it's a balance between those two things so that you can still understand what's happening i love it like this is just how i kind of just consume a lot of stuff right now because again as i said earlier i got shit to do right when people are, are doing things in the world and like I am getting the information, which is proven by, like, any testing that you're given. The problem is, is that so much of this stuff has been set up for lowest common denominator, which is, it has to be. Like, you know, some people take longer to to take in that information or take information in. Some people do need to watch the videos two or three times, that kind of shit, right? Like, and, and they need to account for that. They should be accounting for that. They just don't have any contingency in plan, uh, contingency plan in place for when somebody doesn't require that. So, <laughs> which has been... Which has been the problem with education across the board in this country in a lot of ways. It's why you always hear about, like, oh, he's bored at school, but it's because he's too smart. And it's just like, well, yeah, because nobody has thought to put together a plan in place for in case somebody doesn't need this. What what can we be doing with them instead? And that sucks. Um, but, yeah, so, like, watching a movie at double speed, I, we, I do that for a lot of the stuff that we consume when it comes to certain movies that we talk about. Um, it takes a very particular type of movie for me to say, no, I am going to dedicate the time and the, and the, and the attention to this, that like, that, that the artists intended when they created it. Right. Like if I have the ability to like basically consume my life at double speed, I would do that. <laughs> I can't wait till we cover Click over at the Adam Sandler Cinematic Universe. I'm going to, all these words are going to come back to haunt you. But also, I mean, I will watch Hackers at double speed, but that's because I've watched it at normal speed. I will never speed something up the first time through, if that makes sense. Like you I mean, said, like there's an artist. I'm talking like, about what I'm talking about. I will about. for like YouTube videos and shit. Like if I'm going to oh, watch yeah, an that's hour long true. documentary on like the, the fall of Hitler, like I, I, I could probably double speed that that's one. That's a, that's <laughs> a good point. I, and you know what? 
how's how fucked up is that from me to like consider those YouTube videos that I sometimes speed up specifically because I'm not watching it for entertainment. I'm watching it to get like like a news report YouTube video. I'll speed those up because it's just like what? I just need the information. I don't need the. I found, I found a new show on um on Prime that I've had to find somewhere else to watch so I can watch it at double speed because Prime doesn't let me. Yep. Um, uh, is the but the it's it's called Murder Among the Monarchs or something like that, where basically it's just it's a series of episodes, like eight episodes long, of just like weird, dark murder mystery shit that has happened around famous like royalty throughout all of history, and of course, like episode two is. Uh, was Prince Edward Jack the Ripper, right? Like, they, they, there's always a Jack the Ripper episode in these kinds of shows. Um, and and so I put that on the other day, and I was like, this is silly, and this is fun, but fuck me, I need to not be watching this. It, it was so slowly paced, and the other thing they do in their shows is they repeat a lot of nonsense. They they take about 20 minutes worth of information and turn it into 45 minutes of TV. Like, and so, so I always try and consume that kind of shit at, like, double speed. Don't care if it's the first time I'm watching it. That's about the line for me, though. The second you get above that and it is a little bit more produced and there's a little bit more meaning, yeah, of course. The first time I consume it, I won't consume it at double speed. Right. Like, I watched, when we did Flowers of the Killer Moon, I had sat and I had watched the three hours, wrapped attention, but, like, so that I could have enough of a reminder of it to record for the show, I definitely will. I even said it in the episode that I watched it at, like, double speed. So that I could, like, I couldn't sit there because it's a beautiful movie and I understand why Scorsese did what he did with that film. But, like, I don't have the time to watch three hours to then talk about it on this show. Right? Like, um, this isn't this isn't my only job. I have other things that I had to do in May. Right? Like, I, I, I'm so mad at younger Devin for making May Brendan Fraser History Month because he didn't realize that May would be one of my busiest months for my real job. <laughs> that bastard. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, Novelization of Hackers. If you can find it, it's out there. And you've seen the movie Hackers. Uh, I think it's better that way. I don't know if I would recommend reading it first. Even though it is crazy that they released the book two months before the movie. <laughs> that's yeah, like... It, it isn't, it isn't. I mean, like, this is like... You hear about this shit now, right? Where, like, the golden book of a, of a kid's movie comes out and gives away the whole plot, like, six months before the movie comes out. Although nowadays we get to attribute it to things like the movie got pushed back. The I don't movie know if was that's delayed. Ever, if that yeah. happened with hackers. Yeah, I don't think um, that's what happened to me, with it hackers. Seems, no, it seems more like a marketing move oh, where yeah. they're like, "Oh, based on the book, they get to they get to say that." <laughs> it gives it weird legitimacy to some yeah. people, right? Um, I remember the other one that I remember as a tie into that is the prequel novelization of the Transformers movie, uh, which is like Ghosts of Transformers prequel novel <laughs> um shoot what is it called is it uh nope it's not there uh i don't know the movie prequel that's like a comic too like this was a novelization it was like ghosts of our past or something like that zach from this toy makes me happy ghosts of yesterday uh is a prequel to the michael bay transformers film written by alan dean foster um, and it details a bunch of stuff that then other movies were made and completely annihilated it. Like Dark of the Moon and all of the stuff that is hidden on the moon and Dark of the Moon. Like, there is stuff that flat out completely throws that off in that first I mean, novel. We've talked, yeah. we, we've talked about my love of the Resident Evil books yes. and about how about how it just has to constantly just ignore shit that happened like this there's like there's seven books i think in the series seven or eight books in the series and every book basically just has to kind of address the book from before but then also kind of completely ignore huge elements of it because completely different people have now shown up or or character changes have happened or like somebody dies in one book and then they're just miraculously still there three books later because in the game they are still there <laughs> yeah or somebody dies, and or somebody turns evil, but they're still good in the books. But we know they're Basically. evil. Yeah, yeah, right. It's, it's, yeah, a, that it's an interesting it. thing, and it was super fun to jump into it with Hackers, a movie that I know so well. So I'm I'm having fun with it. I can't wait to finish the actual finishing the actual novel. I think I have thirty PDF pages left. So um, I started reading a book this week too. Reading, oh, what's that? What'd yeah, you read? 
Um, I, I I'm picking up the Wildwood series. Oh, cool. Um, who that's by Colin. Um, Colin May. What's his name? The Colin Malloy. I had to go look at the book real quick. Uh, Colin Malloy. Uh, he's the lead singer for the Decemberists, and oh, it's good. a book that a uh, series that he started writing. Oh, God, probably 10, 15 years ago. There's three books in the series now. But the big thing about it is that Laika had picked it up to option as a film, and they just started putting out some stills recently, and it just looks gorgeous. So I was like, okay, I got I to gotta get in on this so that I, because I'm, I'm so excited. Um, so, yeah, so I started reading that. It's a it's a young adult like series, even maybe even younger than that. I had to go to the kids section of Barnes and Noble to find them. Um, but they're big. They're thick, hefty books. It's good shit. Um, I'm a, so uh, so I'm feeling pretty good uh, about my uh, my consumption lately as well. As, as we started this episode talking about us not reading anymore. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, like, I mean, but the other thing is that like, I'm reading a PDF on my phone. And it's super easy because, you know, like it's backlit. It's I'm able to move it around with me. Right. Sitting outside with it. It's not like, oh, it's a little moist out here. So my pages are sticking together or getting ruined. Like, yeah, but, but like the way you consume it is it, it not really the point. Right. Yeah. It is a it is <laughs> it the is fact that I'm still is... consuming the written word. And even if I were consuming it, like, as you said, as an audio book, I'm still consuming what was written. Yeah. You know what? Like last thing, you haven't found the right book. Book is the part of that that I don't love. Like, my father would say that he doesn't read, but he used to read the Projo cover to cover every day. He would read Sports Illustrated cover to cover, right? Like, that's still reading. It's just not reading novels, right? Like, I don't know when we got real snooty about, like, reading is only reading if it's a novelization. Novel. The French. Yeah, the French... <laughs> That's a- I mean, at some point, like, like, like the idea is like we tr- we started to put some some rules down about decorum, and the French were really infamous for that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, etiquette is qualified definitely as- not an English word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and like what qualified as like proper and what didn't, like those kinds of rules. I think mean, it comes from a lot of that. I just like a lot of the uh, understanding that a lot of my knowledge of this kind of history comes from theater, and so like you did have like like the French putting literal laws on the books about what could and couldn't be on stage. Um, but uh, but yeah, essentially that kind of shit happened at some point in in Western history. Like we had a bunch of people that literally like put their foot down and said no. Like this is no good. This is lower class. This is higher class. This is low art. This is high art. And like we decided that the novel was the form of high art of the written word. And like getting things like unbiased news kind of just like went to the wayside because it was low art anyway. Yeah. Speaking of the French. Really pissed off that Netflix made Emily in Paris that, like, part one, five episodes, part two, five episodes model that they're such big fans of right now. Because uh, I was excited to, like, watch ten episodes of Emily in Paris, but then at the fifth episode, well, that's the end of Emily in Paris. <laughs> and I don't really even love Emily in Paris as much as you'd think. All of my favorite characters are not Emily. But it was sad that, like, it also fell under that whole Netflix, we give you five episodes to binge, and then a month later we'll give you the rest. Like, that 90s show. Like, I haven't watched any of that. And I haven't watched any of that because of some of the things that came to light after the whole Danny Masterson trial about, Mm -hmm. like, who supported him despite the fact that that he was found guilty of those claims and found guilty of those claims because there was like physical evidence that supported it. <laughs> right. Evidence that one might say somebody as close as certain people were, they could not have missed at the time. Yes, exactly. But then to see that like, cause like red and kitty are the only ones who are like in every episode from the original, that 70s show and knowing that mm-hmm. Kirkwood Smith and Deborah Rupp, like, threw their full support behind him. Like, it made it hard to... First of all, I was in a rewatch of that 70s show, which was already kind of hard because Danny Masterson is there as Hyde. Um, But then the whole thing came out, and it's like, so we're probably going to stop watching this show, which sucks for all of the other people who are great in that series who are not Danny Masterson. But then, like, it also, like... Oh, it kind of makes it hard that, like, no, but we know him. We're his friend. It can't be true. Right? They're just trying to railroad him. It's like, eh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
right? Because Ashton yeah, Kutcher and Mila Kunis please. were like that too. Like it's just it made it harder to continue consuming. That's that's all I'm yeah. saying. Um, so I haven't watched any of that '90s show, despite thinking that the first season of that show had some pretty interesting stuff. Like the the gay kid and the whole like I really want to come out to Mrs. Foreman because like she's an adult in my life who like is not family but I'm close enough with that like I can see if I'm ready to do this like that was right. an interesting plot line, right? Yeah. Especially for the '90s where like we talk all the time about like gay panic and such. So them trying to tell being a huge thing. In the yeah, 90s. yeah. So, I don't know. Um, But I like, but they're finally dropping the the third part of that. And it's just like, if it had all just come out, there are people who would have watched it. Like, I don't know if everybody is following it the way that it's it's just, it's so strange. Because, you know, they broke TV, right? By all accounts, their streaming model, their binge model was what everything was chasing. And now that we're where we are with streaming entertainment... Like Netflix is like, well, even we have to modify, right? Like we're we're offering all this without ads, but now they have the ad tier, and now we're not gonna give you the full season. We're gonna make the full season, but then give it to you in slices. I I don't know if this is a matter a matter of like causality or chicken or egg, but but part of the whole like A B season stuff that was really going on that that I had always kind of associated it with is that when Netflix originals first started they were always kind of one season experiences but they were also only six to eight episodes maybe ten but mostly six to eight episodes so when they got into like the sitcom game specifically when they moved into doing the kind of like the sitcom stuff um and the animated sitcom stuff they kind of stuck to that idea that like we have we will budget you for five to ten episodes depending on what you're you're doing lengthwise or actor wise um uh special effects things like that like we will budget you for that that small season but because it's a sitcom they didn't ever want to call it just like a full season so they always called it season part one so like the title is kind of yeah unnecessary to me yeah. like like i wish we had just gone with seasons one season two season three and just dealt with the fact that like no when we do seasons of shows we just do this small season of shows and like i wonder if people would still be shitty about it because if you look back on like game of thrones or not game of thrones a uh, house of cards like early in the day right like and and um uh what were some other early netflix originals that they were doing? i think i like but, bojack like, horseman and how like bojack, each season right? was a season but i knew that they were like working on them at the same time. I mean, the thing that I think of, right, there's two examples from, like, the past-ish year that I would point fingers at. Velma on Max and the fact that everybody's like, how did it get a season two? It didn't get a season two. When it was picked up, the contract was for 20 episodes, and rather than just do 20 episodes, they released the first 10 as season one, and release the mm-hmm. second 10 as season two. But then we look right. at something like How I Met Your Father and the fact that the first season of that was 10 episodes. And then they're like, but it's been approved for a season two. And that's going to be 20 episodes, but they're going to each be doled out in 10 episode chunks. Yeah. If they had been smart, they would have released season two of How I Met Your Father and then season three of How I Met Your Father and kept a season length of that at 10 episodes. Yeah. And yeah. then, like, but I don't know. It's like this weird, like, adherence to, like, this this old kind of concept that, like, seasons need to be 20 some odd episodes long rather than that, like, that 10 episode kind of sweet spot that these streaming services feel they can chance on a budget for something, right? Which is also crazy because of how, like, television is made in in uh, England and the UK and the fact that like you have six, you have this amount of money to spend on this series, create the episodes, however you see fit, which is why you sometimes see a six episode or an eight episode, right? Like it's, it's just three episode and they're just like hour and 10 minute long episodes. Right. Exactly. Um, But then you also end up with like three or four years between series because they write these stories with the intention that we got these, three to six to eight episodes. So that's going to be our story. And then if we can come back and tell more, great, we'll leave doors open for that. But like, we won't 
expect or depend on that. And the audience, same way. The, the audience isn't necessarily sitting around thinking, you know, what's going to come next. Nowadays, that's not so much the case with things like Doctor Who and the way that, like, Moffat was writing Sherlock and stuff like that. And, and um, But even in between all of that, they were doing things like Jekyll and Hyde that were, were, were very much just your three episodes in a series. Like, mm-hmm. this is just it. Or the, the weird Dracula that they did a few years ago, which was, like, modern-day Dracula. But that was just a few episodes in a series, and that was just the series. And, like, I, I, you know, like, I, I don't know why American audiences feel feel like they're entitled to like just never ending like art like it, it, basically it's the simpsons right we got fucked by the simpsons because the simpsons has never ended we assume that any show that does end must have somehow d- like not deserved it or or somebody somebody had to bring the axe down rather than just everybody involved just being like okay we got to the end of what we wanted to do we're gonna go do other sh- things now that's apparently not allowed in this country and that's fucking wild like from from an audience perspective at least it feels like the ways people talk about shows ending uh, unsatisfyingly for them like must mean that that somehow somebody up there uh, up the chain fucked up as opposed to nope this is just like this is the ending that we intended and then you end up with artists that are just like people are going to be expecting us to do more so like because like this is a retelling of this story so obviously we can't just end it here so let's end on a big cliffhanger and then they don't get renewed for another season and then everybody talks about netflix or hbo or or whoever canceling that show but as you rightly said contracts are already in place for so many episodes and if at the end of that they're just like yeah we're not gonna we're not gonna do another one like that's just how TV has always worked. <laughs> like we didn't consider a show canceled in the past just because the contracts ended and they didn't get renewed. There were plenty of shows that got the fucking axe that were just like, oh, we thought we were gonna do a 13 episode season, but three episodes in, we have we have decided to pull the plug on this shit. People don't remember those kinds of shows from way back in the day, back in like the 80s and early 90s oh, yeah. when that shit happened. Like, or things that got a pilot that aired that never went anywhere <laughs> because they don't see that anymore. Now they get like six episodes of a thing and then it doesn't get renewed and they're just like, oh, this is the end. This is, I didn't get enough of this. And it's just like, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> but as, like... much, as much as the Simpsons are definitely one of those things to point at, advertisers are the other issue in terms of that. Because an advertiser doesn't want to, to like pay for advertising for six episodes of a show that everybody loves. We want to make sure that we're getting our money's worth. So like they're like, we want to buy 20 episodes that we're advertising during. So even if you're adapting a show that has like 12 episodes, suddenly you need to create eight more episodes for the American version of that show. Right. I I do think that there is something to be said about the creators, though, as well involved. There are certain there. There's a large number of creators, perhaps even the majority of creators nowadays when it comes to um, television, especially where they understand the power that an audience can have now. And by creating something that generates this fervor, that people demand more seasons going out of their way to to create that. And not necessarily having the end game in mind themselves, like they're writing themselves literally into corners, right? That does happen, right? They, there are creators that that know that they've only been contracted for twenty episodes. Velma, I, do you like? I, I'm going to be very, I'm very curious to know how the ending of season two of Velma goes. Oh, it ends with a, it ends with a cliffhanger. S- it, on I'm a show being completely that honest with famously you. or or infamously, right? Like, well, this is a good example of this, though. If do you think this show's going to get a third season? They've like, already they said that contract- they're done with Mindy Kaling. They've already said that they've they've decided not to extend. That was the weird thing about Velma season. But does it get a? But does Velma season three happen? No. Just because they're done with Mindy Kaling does doesn't necessarily. Do you think Velma season three happens? No. Okay. No. Well, well then she's there you go, the, right? Well, I mean, so, like, as much why, as I say she's like, the driving force behind it, she's one of the executive producers on it. It's more of the Charlie, not Kaufman. I got to look up his name. But it's more his baby, and she just plays Velma. But like the weird thing is, they said they're done with Mindy Kaling. We're we're not renewing her contract and all of that stuff. But yeah. then. They're like, Velma season two is coming. Everybody's like, but huh? And then if you look at it, it's like Velma was originally picked up for 20 episodes. So right. those 20 episodes were made. We've just decided not to extend that contract. But when were those episodes made? Because were they made at a point at which maybe the creators no- seeing the writing on the wall could have perhaps maybe not ended on a, on a big major cliffhanger? I don't, I... Like that. that is when it becomes a big problem for me is like, 
who who knew when that this show was maybe not going to go much further and the choices that were made to continue down a very obvious path of of dissatisfaction right and people always want to point to the studios in this case because they are the ones that get to make that final call but if the studio made that call at a certain point and told the artists what was going on and said to them, hey, you have to the end of this season and then we're, this is it, and the artist still chooses to continue this because they think in their head, if I can just stick to the plan and stick to the path, I can convince people we deserve more, and then they never get it, and then nobody's happy. The artist is unhappy. They never get to finish their story and tell the, the story they wanted. The audience isn't happy because they never got an, a complete experience. And the studios don't know what to fucking do with themselves now because they're, they're like they're canceling shit left and right because things aren't catching on fast enough, and they they don't have they don't have complete experiences to sell to people. So like it, it's this it, 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 there's blame all around in this shit. Oh yeah. Um, Charlie Grandy, by the way, the creator of Velma, I know that Mindy Kaling was given all the like praise for it, but Charlie Grandy was the big driving force behind it. And yeah, she was a producer on it. So she supported it and she did the voice of Velma. Um, but yeah, and that was, uh, that, that cliffhanger in a weird way also kind of feels like an, an F you, like maybe if you like the show, like go fuck yourself, you should have been there for us instead of hate watching us like the show was canceled despite all of the quote unquote hate viewing, right? Just like the accolade. Everybody's like, Oh, it got fired. It got canceled because of, you know, all this stuff. But then someone did the math and I think it was like $66,000 per minute on screen for the Mm -hmm. accolade. (laughs) Like I would like to actually, so basically if they weren't making record numbers, it's the, it's the billion dollar movie problem, right? If it's not making, record-breaking numbers it's not paying for itself at this point and that is untenable like you can't make television that way you can't make movies that way yeah uh given that each episode was spread spread across roughly 35 to 45 minutes the acolyte would have had a staggering cost of six hundred and seventy thousand dollars per minute so yeah that's huge (laughs) to like if you're not getting the return on investment there because oh god like that that gets to multiple million dollars in like in in a minute at every two minutes it's a million dollars like without even like going to hear too that far comparison though i would like to hear that comparison to a show that people consider successful like what what is the what is the the, the money yeah, I, per minute count on like modern family i have to wonder well, right that's a uh, you know what? let's see if that's available because we have the internet in front of us Modern just because family. like you talk about a show that got really famous for the amount of money people were getting paid, including the child actors as they grew yeah. up. Part of the big deal that people like to talk about on that show is the ways in which the the as the kids grew up, they were just treated just like the rest of the adults. So a lot of their like contracts and stuff got recombobulated to be more like the adult contracts once they were actually adults themselves. So that I mean by the end of that show, you're talking about a cast of a dozen or so people that must have been making millions of dollars an episode or at least one or two of them must have been right yeah so i mean like the here's like just a number this is from screen rant we're not big fans of screen rant but money like sofia vergara as an example started at thirty thousand to sixty five thousand per episode and then ended at five hundred thousand per episode yeah yeah um, yeah, so I mean, so so you end up with them trying to like reformat like entire storylines to to like remove people so that they don't have to have everybody in every episode so they don't have to get paid, but they still are spending a bunch of money, right? Yeah. And so like just because it is like one of the most successful shows of the last like 15, 20 years, like like what was the what is the money count on a something like that? Because basically six hundred thousand dollars per minute for for Star Wars sounds like a lot, but. I'd be willing to bet there's a lot of shows out there that are kind of at that level once they kind of get to this point where they're paying actors upwards of five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand dollars an episode, right? So let's say an episode of Modern Family is twenty two minutes. So do 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 do. So that is roughly twenty two point seven thousand dollars. A minute okay. for each of so those So if we actors. rounded that down a little bit, assuming some people got paid less and some people got paid more, $20,000 a minute for an actor to be on screen. 
and this is just the actors. That's just the and actors. most We're of the scenes in that show yeah. have four to five actors. So there's there's a hundred thousand dollars a minute just on the acting alone, right? And like, so it starts creeping up, right? Like it start like like shows that's you know that's what it's costing to make stuff. But when those numbers are record breaking numbers, that requires record breaking audience numbers and record breaking advertising dollars. And that's just that one to one doesn't necessarily happen, right? Just because they're willing to pay people more money to be on screen has not necessarily equaled out to getting that much money back in return. This is the business they're dealing with, right? Exactly. But I mean, I guess where you look at the reason why that number for the acolyte is as big as it is. And it's as important as it is, not as big as it is, but important is if that's how much they're spending per minute of episode and then like 18 people are watching, there's Mm -hmm. no way that that's worth it. Right. Right, Assuming $10 per subscription, right. For those 18 people. And then it covers two months. That's only like $360. Yeah. That but the that real would problem be in all of this, on as is always the case, right. But the real problem in all of this, as is always the case, is that there's no real transparency about what's all going the, on. All that's hidden stuff. behind the, the curtain, right? That's true. So, so we can say all we want about the cost of the Agolite and who was actually watching it, but we don't actually know, like at the end of the day, what the actual numbers were on that. Like Disney has has put some stuff out, but we also know Disney is not necessarily to be trusted in some of these conversations. The the money that they talk about making or not making and who's going to get what. I mean, like, not two, three years ago on this very show, we were talking about some, like, weird shit they were pulling with Scarlett Johansson and, and Black, Black Widow, Widow right? Yep. And, and, like, the ways that they were just, like, manipulating contract stuff around to just not have to pay her a bunch of money. And it's just, like, that's fucking buck wild. Um, and, like, we know that HBO got caught in all of this stuff and Max got caught in all of this shit with, like, canceling fully done projects just because they they thought they could get some like tax break money and like i've i've heard people say that that story is a little bit more misleading than not but that is the narrative right now so like it's hard as an audience member without the transparency to see exactly what is going on in these in this decision making like it's hard to not feel like hey i was watching that like, why did they cancel this thing that I was watching? Or vice versa. Like, I didn't know anybody was watching that. Why is it still getting seasons? And it's just like, well, we just, you know, if we had hard numbers to look at as audience members, we could at least understand why certain the decisions are being made. But nobody wants to do that, right? No, Nobody on the studio side wants to give give the audience, like, all of the That's information. That's too much like, power. It's too much power. And it's not just the audience. It's also you know, having a cultivated presentation to present to advertisers, right? Mm-hmm. To say, this is how much money this is wa- this is making for us, but then, like, well, how many people are watching, though? No, 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 but this is how much money it's making for us. But, no, but we want to know how many eyeballs are on it. But this is how many people are watching. Yeah, but, like, exactly. We need more information than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's... It's the latest bit of snake oil sales. And this is not, it's... and this is not too far out of the realm of possibility. Like, I, I don't know if people remember Nielsen boxes. Yep. Like we, there was a time where we had some, not completely, but like more transparent things that we, like numbers we could point to, and say, well, houses with Nielsen boxes are behaving in this way. So we understand that at least one in every, what, like 100, 200 houses, whatever that number was back in the day. Like we understand that that like families on average are behaving this way because of this method. At least it was something. We don't even have anything like that nowadays. As much as even that might have been kind of skewed in, in, in its various ways, at least that was something. Exactly. I remember like being a young person like we have to watch that they know. And then my father being like, yeah, but we're not a Nielsen house. So it doesn't matter if we watch or not, Devin. Yeah, it, just, like, it really doesn't matter if we watch or like, not. I right? want you to understand that. And it would be like, oh, okay. So I'm just going to watch the stuff that I want to watch. Like, I, I I, am not part of the system. But then, you know, I can still get mad at the system because of, I don't know. It's all, it's all wonky. I want to talk about vampire survivors. I'm at the point where I want to talk about my epic 18-hour stream getting the Platinum and Vampire Survivors but mostly because of what I sent you, Siegen. And I sent it to you separately because I had already sent it in the uh, Discord. I'd like to look at and discuss the trophies for Vampire Survivors and how kind of messed up the whole situation is. 
All right. Well, I got the list up in front of me now, so let's talk about it. So, Vampire Survivors Trophies, that is 41 trophies, including the Platinum. So, 40 trophies that you need to gain to get it. But when you download Vampire Survivors, the progress that it is tracking is out of 221 trophies. So I thought, like, my whole goal was I'm going to stream and I'm going to get this platinum trophy. And I didn't want to look at the trophy list because I already know this is the stuff on the unlockables that I have to do. But around the 15-hour mark, I was starting to get a little bit discouraged. Because all the stuff that I had left was, like, gain X amount of levels, but there was no way for me to get to, like... I was outscaled there. I didn't have the items that you can unlock that bring in more enemies that can mean faster level ups. Like eggs were the only way to do that. But like I didn't have any of the monetary stuff in order to get eggs. Like all the money stuff is all hidden in DLC. So someone that I was watching, it was Claude. Thank you, Claude, for watching. Was like, you should look at the trophy list. And I looked at the trophy list and the main game, just the main game, is then broken out into DLC trophy packs one like one through ten. But it's stuff that you have to achieve in order to get stuff in that main 40. <coughs> but that 220 that they count also includes the you have to pay for DLC is three lists. Um extra stuff added later on in the game is lists. So like you should like this trophy list is so convoluted. Like DLC trophy pack 15, DLC trophy pack 16, DLC trophy pack 17. What is going on here? DLC trophy this list pack goes on 22. Forever and it's all DLC tro- 22. DLC trophy pack 22 is the bottom list. <laughs> yeah. So, but the ones to focus on are the top 10. But then let's look at in the the top 10 DLC trophies list. But in the base game trophy list, there is the trophy for Complete the collection 1.0. And stuff for that trophy that unlocks Queen Sigma, you have to do everything in DLC Trophy Pack 1, DLC Trophy Pack 2, 3, and 4 in order to unlock everything. Stuff you have to unlock in DLC Trophy Pack 6 is required to have the entire collection. Like, it's this weird way how they parsed it out. So you still have to get some, like... Uh, trophy pack seven, right? The Fiera de Tufalo and eight, the Sparrow, those weapons, those are part of collection one. But the only thing that you need to do to pop that platinum, which I eventually did after 17 hours and 38 minutes. Let me make sure that I have that number. Correct. Um, I know I sent it to you. Yeah. 17 hours, 38 minutes. What is those first 40 trophies? So at that time where I finally checked the trophy list, I was only missing two trophies, which was to unlock uh, the guy uh, Ambro Joe. But I don't know what his trophy is called. It's like near the bottom. Uh, no, no, no. I, I don't know, man. I'm not going to be Sorry. able to help you. You're no, the no, expert no. on that. Oh, Sir Ambro Joe is the trophy. Defeat 6,000 stage killers in the fifth level. And then by doing that, that finally completed my collection, which unlocked Queen Sigma. And then with Queen Sigma, I got a hundred kill a hundred thousand enemies to use the victory sword. And then I got mm-hmm. the platinum to pop. But looking at it and the way that they share the whole story, like it looked like I had to get 221 trophies in order to get the platinum to pop. And then the other weird thing is DLC trophy packs 11 through. Uh, 15, that is DLC. That is paid for content. That is stuff that yeah. you have to, right now I think it's like $1.50 for each of them. Mount Moonspell and the Tides of the Fiskari. But then 16 through 22, those are all free and included with the game. So like why is stuff that's in the game lower than stuff that you need to pay for? Like it was just such a misleading I mean, it's advertising. It's You see that you can't get that trophy. You wonder why you can't get that trophy. You look into it and you realize you have to buy the DLC to get that trophy, so you spend more money. Right, but you don't need to buy the DLC to get that trophy. 
You just need to complete those first 40 trophies to get the platinum to pop. And that's still like beat the game type stuff. But but I thought you said in order to complete those 40 trophies you need to do stuff in the DLCs. But but not in but not in the Tides of Fiscari DLC. The only DLCs that matter are through to Trophy Pack 10. Right. And so even you need then, to buy those DLCs need... in order to, to but get the But the they're platinum. not actually DLCs. They're just called DLCs. But all of that stuff is in the game. That's what I'm saying is the problem. The, instead of making one trophy list that included all of those things, they decided to turn them, they call them DLC trophy packs, but they're not. They're just part of the base game. The only DLC so trophy packs that are here are are trophy pack 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Those require you to download something besides the base game. But every trophy list is called a DLC trophy pack. But that's not what it is. It's all in the base game. That's really wild. So so have we ever talked about how like trophies why trophies even exist, right? Like they're they're like <laughs> no. required by by console developers to like like in order to sell your game on the at least on the playstation store i i i'm not sure about xbox i i think this is the case for xbox because they kind of started the whole they started the the achievement thing yeah um but like your game is required to have an achievement system the only reason i even know that is because of the telltale games and there was all of this stuff when the walking dead telltale games had come out um people just like laughing at like trophies popping for chapters ending and it's like nobody everybody's gonna like that's just you're gonna get this trophy because you're going to play the game until you're gonna read the book you're gonna see the thing but however you wanted to talk about the telltale games at the time they were just like that's why why are there trophies in this game because it's so ridiculous and it became out that like a, a lot of, or at least the discussion was a little bit more transparent at the time you're required to have an achievement system in your game in order to sell on these systems, right? And so you end up in this position where, like, you end up with ridiculous trophies, you end up with weird trophies, you also end up with a lot of broken trophies. And then it came out that, like, there are standards that you're supposed to meet in order for for publication on the consoles, but, like, you only have to prove you meet those standards, like, day one, and, like, if anything ever comes out that, like, that shit's broken in, like, the trophy system, there are supposed to be rules in place and standards in place about fixing them that people have tried to, like, take games to task on with Sony, and Sony's never done anything to, like, enforce those, right? So it's, like, this weird thing where, like, they required this system to be in place, but then have never done any real work to, like, maintain it? <laughs> I still have Borderlands trophies. I think you and I, right? We like borked a bunch of Borderlands trophies, didn't we? We did break a bunch of trophies, yeah. Um Yeah. Yeah. Because like because we were doing each we were playing in each other's games and like the ways that trophies were popping for one of us and not the other and shit like that. Yeah. So like there's stuff like that that just I'm never gonna get platinum. Not that I ever really care about it as much as as, as you do or, or many people do. But like I, I, I just there are certain games I could not get the platinum on because I've I've completely fucked the way the trophy is. And like and and so this is really interesting and weird because this means that I don't know if this is because of like Sony and saying like the ways that maybe these these DLC like trophies were like implemented at some point because the because the other side of the trophy system being super weird is Vampire Survivors history has been weird. And that is something that we have talked about since Vampire Survivors has come out. We've been yeah. following this. But the ways in which it has introduced um, updates and mechanics and characters and stuff, like, it was it was kind of a mishmash on, on PC because of the way that it was created. But you have to imagine by the time they're doing this port to PlayStation, which has been a huge deal, they don't consider it to be version 6 point whatever, right? They must consider it to be this is the definitive the definitive version, right? Exactly. So looking at the list of trophies that I shared for you from bsprofiles.com, going down to DLC pack 16, they started adding that term extra before any of the achievements that were added to the game post the version 1.0 release. And these are things that were added to the game as free updates. Right. So for like the tiny bridge stuff for the level tiny bridge, if you bought the base game, you got access to it when it released, which is why I like the DLC packs for like Legacy of Moonspell and Tides of Fiskari. Those don't say extra because they are actually tied to a DLC that you need to right. buy and pay for. 
Okay. And they are not included for free with this, but based on the way that everything else is and the fact that they're like in the middle of the trophy list, not after all of the stuff included in the base game, one could be forgiven for not understanding that. For thinking that that's included with the game. Because why, when I download the game, am I given trophy lists for DLC that I do not own? At least all the other ones, right? DLC trophy packs 1 through uh, uh, 10. 1 through 10 is all stuff that is achievable in the base game. And most of it needs to be done in order to fill out those top 40 achievements to unlock the Platinum. Or, or will, like, naturally be done in the course of them as well. Like, right. I'm looking at Trophy Pack 8 right now, where, like, level 5, reach level 5. Yeah. I mean, like, you're going to get through that. You're going to get there in the first five minutes playing the game. And, like, that unlocks the wings, crown, parts of the game that I just thought were just parts of the game. Destroy 20 light sources to unlock the fire wand. Like, right. that kind of thing. And all of those things that you're speaking of, like, you need to unlock the wings in order to complete the collection. So, like, right. yeah. that is part of the game that you have to do. Like, the thing I've always liked about Vampire Survivors, right? We've been talking about Vampire Survivors for at least two years on this podcast. Is the fact that they have an unlock list, and it, when you're not sure what to do to proceed with the game, you go to the unlock list, and then you see, oh, well, I haven't done this yet, and that's going to unlock something. And occasionally, mm-hmm. when you do those unlocks you'll unlock more things on that to-do list that will further the story along, right? I'm still a big proponent of Vampire Survivors having three separate endings. Like, the first ending is when you get the yellow sign because that completely changes the game. The second one is when you beat uh, Megadeth. And then the third one is where you defeat the director. But then there's still a lot of game after that. (laughs) But, like... The defeating the director would be like the definitive ending because that's the one that rolls credits. But you know, when you beat Megadeth, it feels like, oh damn, like I just beat the game. Cause it's like he's a megatron he's a mega zord of death. Right? Yeah, All yeah. the death parts come together like Voltron or, or a Megazord to like so, fight against you. So are these DLC packs, are they referencing the DLC as it would have been on PC? No. Like, is it that these are, this is, so that's even wilder. It's yeah. like, how did they decide what these were going to be divvied out into? I wonder if it's a platinum, I wonder if there's requirements around difficulty of reaching a platinum or something right like like that being like there's something in that realm right Right. like you can't make a game with 240 requirements like 240 trophies you must have trophies in your game and and they must be somewhat obtainable maybe yeah i don't i don't but here's here's the strange thing right so looking at because that discussion that you just had is this stuff i've like got it doled out torona's box was not added until much later in the original game, right? Like pr- prior to the version 1.0. And it like, I started playing in April of 2022. Tarona's box wasn't added until like July of 2022. But then it sits okay. above like Slor, Slor Clarice, who was a character that existed in the game when I started playing the game in April of 2022. So right. there so doesn't seem to like be any rhyme or reason. Or yeah. Yeah. It's just You're like, weird. I mean, there was a whole big thing about Vampire Survivors took so long to get certified and given a release date because of figuring out the trophy part of it. And then to go one step further than that, the game almost didn't hit its August 29th release to PlayStation because they're like, the trophy stuff is not done and is not compliant. So yeah, they, so it has to be that there's some weird rules around what the trophies can be. Yeah. It's so weird. Yeah, it's I just, I don't, and it made, so I have been sitting with a thought in 2024. Um, I, I don't know if I brought it up here. If I already did, then I, I'm reiterating it. But there's been this Kaizo Mario game per chance that has like a whole slew of levels that you beat that like do not count towards your exit count. Because it's the same level, you just do, like, a different path through it. But you have to have already beaten all the levels to unlock those paths. 
And I keep using that game as an example of games feeling like they just don't end in 2024. Right. And I feel bad. Right. Because Vampire Survivors happened. I streamed for 18 hours, much longer than I thought it was going to take me. I thought it like it was going to be at most 13 and a half hours because that's what Vampire Survivors said. They said it's 13.5 hours of content. But then, like, I got to that point and I'm like, well, there's other stuff that I have to do. So, like, and my collection isn't popping. Like, what haven't I done that I feel should be done? Like, it just what is now considered part of collection V.1.0. And I yeah. it just it I, it just feels so like I unlocked the candy box when I unlocked one of the added weapons from one of the extra stages. I beat Whiteout, and that's what unlocked the candy box for me. So I'm like, so I don't know because it's supposed to be get every weapon and its upgrades, but I haven't unlocked like Ambro Joe yet. But that game is like, it's just it's such a weird system and it kind of felt like now vampire survivors has turned into one of those never ending games, mm-hmm. but not in like the well, way that service, man. Yeah. But it's their single I mean, player that's, game. That's, that's, what audiences, that's what, that's what companies think audiences want every game to be nowadays. Audience like, because at the end of the day, the guys that are running game development now, and this is the same thing that has happened across the board in a lot of different industries are business first they're not game developers that are running these things they are they they are they're so executives like look at everything that's going money. on with like the trophy yeah. stuff with sony yes it's sounding more and more like sony were the ones really pushing for this trophy system to be a certain way and exist a certain way and putting parameters on it rather than just letting this developer just put the game out they 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 held his feet to the fire on all of this weird trophy shit and this is what we ended up with right and it is because and and because you have these guys these business minded guys there they want to look at games as software and software as service is the way that the tech industry has been going for the last 20 years more than that probably but like every tech company i've ever worked for every software company i've ever worked for they didn't just sell you the software and they were one and done they were telling you software and the service to go along with it to keep that thing updated to keep that thing running to make sure that you were always happy and always paying money it's why so many companies have started to go towards the um the monthly business model the monthly the, the, monthly, the monthly fee business model yeah. as opposed to just one and done pricing is because they they can then use that as a reason to to keep pushing shit on you and keep getting money out of you and, and you're not just paying for the software you're paying for the service to come along with it and that's how these guys also want to run game development because to them it's just another piece of software and so they just want to sell they want to put it in people's hands and then they want to they want to get that monthly fee from you they want to get that 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 you know that payment for a thing that you've already bought once so i thought this thing would just work nope turns out you got to keep paying us if you want this thing to keep working and it's it's i mean you know it's essentially fucking blackmail yeah Right. I mean, it's the old model of you don't make money on the the razor. You make money on the blades. They just want to find ways to sell us blades. Uh-huh. And keep it going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> um, yeah. I mean, you, you just because you already mentioned the, the Kaizu Mario stuff, um, we have not yet talked about. I haven't got my hands on yet, but I want to um, Mario and the Rainbow Stars. Have you have you touched that yet? I have seen it. I really want to play it. I haven't I haven't done it yet. I was it looks I fucking even, rad. It does look incredible. Um, I'm excited to try it out, and that's a different sort of thing. Like that's more of a fan made as opposed to what the Kaizo is, which is existing in this one thing and just trying to make the hardest stuff possible. I don't I don't know. Like and here I mean I I just want to put like looking at the Xbox achievement requirements, which they are very transparent about i don't know about playstations i i haven't been able to find anything like a game at launch needs a minimum of 10 achievements and cannot go over a hundred maximum achievements however semi-annually so between january and june to july december you can add up to a hundred trophies with a lifetime limit of 500 trophies per game so when vampire survivors came out there they had about 100 achievements to get the, you know, I've unlocked everything. And it was just everything that was on that unlocked list. So a year later, that's why Sony has all this. And I think, I'm fairly certain, like, 40 to 50 is the maximum number of trophies that your game can have in its base list. Because I'm basing that off of, like, I think Spider-Man had 47 
and that's a Sony made game, right? So of right, course they're right. also going to get maybe some special treatment there. So let's say 50 is the maximum that you can have. That'd be 49 trophies and then 50 tro- trophy 50 is your platinum trophy. Cause that's the other thing is that that goes into the count as well. So what they have to do in order to have all these extra trophies is, yo dog, we heard you like trophies. So we, we gave you a trophy your for trophies. your trophies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it is so, but they do allow DLC trophy lists. So like by taking, the however many trophies that they had, 145 trophies are what I ended up having to unlock in order to get the platinum. And some of those are not necessary. Some of those are not ones that feed into. I have no reroll trophies, for example, right? I don't have any rerolls, but I have I have the platinum trophy. That means that as any of the extra characters you unlock by killing a set number of enemies, I have not gotten them to level 80. And that's because before you're able to like do level 80 in the inverse stuff to unlock like tiny bridge or bat country, which give you items that allow for more enemies to show up, which in turn allow you to level up higher. Like this just like it was impossible to get there, but I still got the platinum trophy, but I don't, I don't want to talk about like, it's just, it was such a weird way to do it. And it kind of cast a pallor over it. But also I played and was engaged by the game for that, like, full 18 hours, right? I also had no caffeine. I just drank water the entire time. It was kind of like a detox for me, which felt pretty good. Just threw that in the trash by drinking the Beetlejuice Fanta. But, you know, mess a mess, right? Life goes on. But it is one of those things, like, so I still like the game Vampire Survivors. And I have to give them credit for that, right? Because it's $5 on PlayStation and I got 18 hours of enjoyment. And I've still gone back and played other stuff since getting the Platinum Trophy. Because I'd like to achieve all of these trophies. I don't know if I want the DLC. I know the DLC is cheap right now, but but that. So it's still a good game. If you still have not tried Vampire Survivors, uh, give it a try now that it's on PlayStation. For those people who didn't have a Switch when it came out on Switch. Or Xbox when it came out on Xbox. Or Steam when it came out on Steam for $3. It's still worth it. And I will say this. The PlayStation 5 version is the stablest version of Vampire Survivors that I have played in the two-ish years that it has been available. Uh, so stable, in fact, that the hurry option, which is a way to like make the time move twice as fast, almost breaks the game because you don't have that weird little bit of slowdown that like every other version of the game has despite it moving at double speed. Like it, like oh, yeah, it's, it's like a frame rate drop like or a, something. Yeah. Right? like it, like there's something something happens when you turn that hurry option on that actually kind of it make it, it, yeah. <laughs> Even though but, the timer, yeah, I'm not surprised the faster. PS5 can handle that though. Yeah, the PS5 handles it like crazy. Like I, like I didn't real I was having trouble with the final level, not the final final level, but like the Capella Magna level, the stage five, and I'm like I don't understand like what this is like I'm not getting any of the upgrades that I usually get like stuff stuff's not showing up and it's because I had hurry on. And then once I shut off hurry, I'm like, oh, like now the game knows what to do. It's like this system is so powerful that the hurry up where it usually triggers like a little bit of a frame rate drop, even though the timer is going twice as fast. No, no, no. I can handle this on two times mode. So now you've just made it harder on yourself. And that was mm-hmm. that was a cool sort of thing that was going on right there. So, so like. I do want to make it clear, like, in terms of games feeling like they never end, right? There's a difference between that and a game that just has, like, good meat on it, has some good heft, right? Because, like, I just passed the 50-hour mark in SeaWorld Heist 2, and I've got... I'm I'm approaching the end of the game. I'm not there yet. I'm betting it's going to be about a 60-hour experience when all is said and done. And, like, that feels... And it feels like a good, well-rounded experience. I don't feel like there's anything arbitrarily, like, elongating that game in a way that it doesn't need to be. Right, and I think the the um, the Seamroll games have always been really good at that kind of timing. Like right when you start to kind of get to the end of of like your your patience for for a mechanic, a new one is introduced, or or once you kind of get to the end of like what you you kind of feel you, like you've had enough time with a story, and it, like the, it's coming to an end. They're really good at pacing, right? And and like and that's the difference between a game that feels like it's going on forever and never ending, and they're just trying to bilk time and money out of you versus a game that just feels 
hefty right and complete and and like honestly the kind of thing that we want from experiences now you know is is like we want to feel like we, we put you know the right amount of money towards something the right amount of time towards something and like and so like as somebody that is approaching a 60 hour mark on a game but like it feels good versus you who only played for 20 hours and felt like man i feel like they're pushing their limits with this is it's a, it's an interesting kind of dichotomy right because like i do think that it is possible to have this kind of experience still out there and in, in gaming is just few and far between nowadays that's all no i think it's an interesting thing it, th what i want is games to have a goal in mind right a lot of this like philosophy something like dark souls for example right dark souls 2 to get the platinum from that game, I had to do a lot. That game is long. And I am... The world, not just me, but historically, Dark Souls 2 is a game that people are like, it's kind of the weakest in the series, right? And of course, you'll find people who disagree with that, but in terms of it... And my problem with Dark Souls 2, if I were going to sum it up, is rather than starting from a hub world and going out into the world and then suddenly finding your back in the hub world 10 hours later... What Dark Souls 2 does is like you can go in you can go north, south, east or west from this hub world and then you eventually reach the end <laughs> and then the only mm -hmm. way back is to warp back to the hub world. Like rather than have this like interesting way where things like come back to the beginning or connect to maybe if you go east long enough eventually you'll run into the northern area, like the game feels like you have four paths to go on, go down these four paths, and then return here and you can go into the castle. And that feels yeah, it's, very... Um, yeah. it's, it's the same criticism I remember when the um, the first uh, Rage game came out way back in the day, right? People were expecting this, like, well, to, to be frank, Borderlands-style experience is what they really got compared, compared to a lot, where kind of, like you were saying, you would enter areas and then realize and once you entered them, you'd unlock areas that actually led you back to original areas and stuff, and it made the world feel very complete. Whereas Rage, when it came out, it very much did this, like, this center, like, excellent spoke style thing, where, like, you would come back to this world, and then you'd go off down a level, you'd get to the end of that, and it would warp you back, and then you'd go off down a level, and then you'd get to the end of that, and it would warp you back to this to this hub world um and people hated that like it was one of the biggest um, criticisms of that of that original game is that the world felt very empty to them because it really felt like you would just like be in this hub world go down these weird corridors and then just get warped back to the hub world as opposed to something like borderlands where it felt like it was the world of pandora very complete um so it's it's interesting that you say that you talk about this being a, a, an issue in the in, in the dark soul in dark souls 2 um because it, it very much reminds me of of rage yeah, and then like Dark Souls three, they were able to like find a way to balance it, where you mm -hmm. still got to go out and you connected all these worlds, and it felt really cool. And then like you had to go back to the beginning, and then you can finally go left, and left takes you to something that you couldn't access until you went and collected what was in the rest of the world. But you still mm -hmm. like sort of connected to that hub world in a way. Like it, I, I don't know. Like I. It's just like that disappointment where like it doesn't feel like a complete experience. But at the same time, for Dark Souls 2, a game that I don't enjoy, when I was playing it, I was into the gameplay loop of it all. And the original version of that game, which they also sort of like the Scholar of the First Sin update, where they're like, people found the game too easy, so we added a bunch of high-level monsters to earlier areas. It's like, oh, okay, that, that's... That completely changes this whole experience. But also, mm -hmm. difficulty in gaming is a, a whole other episode of the podcast that we could do. Because I feel yeah. like this whole obsession with making games impossible is also a big, like, problem with gaming in 2024. Like, Well, it's another way to arbitrarily lengthen the, the game and ways that they can sell shit to you right because like you you get dlc packs that will get better leveling and better better gear and shit like that and then you can go turn around and suddenly that thing you couldn't do in the main game you suddenly are able to get through with the inner breeze because you spent 15 extra bucks on the dlc yeah so it's uh it's it's an interesting thing that to like strike that balance but you know the original dark souls 2 i thought it was interesting i'd been like venturing down a pathway for so long that it got to the point where my weapons were starting to break 
And the question was, do I go back to the hub world? Like I've walked all this way. I don't have a way to warp back. Or is this forcing me? And, you know, think about like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom and all of my complaints about like weapons breaking, right? But like Dark Souls 2 found this thing where like I'd gone through like three or four different biomes down this path before my weapons were starting to break. So then it was this thing where I'm like, well, I'm forced to use some of the weapons that I found, right? Like as opposed to, oh, I used this sword four times and it broke the way that it kind of works in those Zelda titles I brought up. Like it, like it gave me time to care about something, but then forced me to switch to something else because there was no other option at that time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I just, but we've also talked about Zelda and the fact that they're giving you weapons all the time. So they want you to explore and experience, experience and experiment. And they're giving you the same weapons. Yeah. So like, if you like, if you like the rusty great sword, well, guess what? Here's six of them. Yeah. So then you could just keep those on you at all times. And then you just got to make sure you're timing your battles, right? So you don't fuck yourself and go in with a broken sword. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, like there, there's the ways that they deal with that are definitely different and controversial but they but they do make strides to try and and balance that as well yeah so i mean i don't dig that but i do i remember that first time i was playing dark souls 2 getting as far as i got and then being like oh my gosh my weapon is like bro broken it is straight up broken and i can go repair it which is nice right because you don't you can't repair everything in the breath of the wild games like you can feed it to octa rocks and, and all that other stuff but also like, I could get repair powder. I could have brought repair powder, and I'm the idiot who didn't think to bring that with me. But also, now I have to, like, focus on using a different weapon that I found while I've been exploring these last four hours. Well, like, I love Tears of the Kingdom's answer to, to, to all of that in Breath of the Wild, which is the, um, what's the, what do they call it, the fuse power that they use? Yeah. Where the trick is, is, like, you just learn what a good, like, fuse, like, uh, combo is, and then you just keep, you, you do what you can to keep the um to keep the main part of the weapon safe you never lose that when you when you break a, a thing it doesn't break the whole thing you just break the fuse and fuse it to something else when things start to get get sticky <laughs> yeah i know it's kind of like how and that's funny because it just seems like the dead rising 2 of it all where in dead rising 1 your <laughs> weapons break but in dead rising 2 you could combine weapons and then they'll last longer and then once right, you've right. found a combination, like, it's easier to remake that combination. I am stupid excited for the Dead Rising, like, re-release that's coming later this month. I just have to admit that. Like, I've been thinking I, about it more and more, and, like, I so am excited I, to try are that they, are game. They gonna, are they going to be on PS5? Because, like... Yeah, no, there's, you can pre-order it right now. That might be... Because the... the, the We'll talk about it when the time comes. But the fact that, like, its whole selling point with the Xbox 360 was look at how many zombies it can have on screen, I have to imagine that's going to go up by, like, a million percent on yeah. PS5. So, but but we'll talk about yeah, it. Talking about how, like, Vampire Survivors is finally stable when you're trying to mm -hmm. push it to the limit. Yes, Siege, and it's going to be something else. <laughs> yeah. And I'm excited. I'm excited to see it. Uh, but, yeah, like I just don't know. I just feel like... I want a game, I'm okay if a game is only like 90 minutes, if I feel like the game designer got to tell the story they wanted to tell, right? Yeah. I liked yeah. Animal Well for what Animal Well was in the beginning. Where I started to get tired was when it was like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of different things that you need to solve by like communicating with other people online. And it's like, you know, I kind of just wanted to play this single player game single player. I didn't want to solve giant puzzles with a community. And I mean, I know that talks to me and what I'm desiring as a gamer, but it is just like, I still would recommend Animal Well to people. But then when you get to these unlocks that like are fun and optional, like it's like, I, I don't know how to feel about this at this point. When does optional and fun stop being fun? is the question I'd like to try to find the answer to. But we're probably not going to find that answer today. Uh, last thing to talk about is Castlevania freaking Dominus Collection stealth dropping this week. So you can finally play all the DS Castlevania games. And uh, the bigger thing of that is that Haunted Castle is involved. That's the first arcade Castlevania game. But also right. Haunted Castle Revisited, which is 
kind of a new Castlevania game in 2024. Like, yeah, yeah, it's got the bones of Haunted Castle, but also brand new upgrades, brand new movement tech. Like, nobody was expecting a new Castlevania this year. And lo and right. behold, Konami stealth dropped it the last week of August. And I wonder if they were trying to compete with the Vampire Survivors on PS5 launch. But I will admit, I definitely bought the Dominus Collection, and now I just have way more games that I have to complete before, like, Bak- I want to finish Japanese Bakuru before it releases on the 3rd of September. I want to <laughs> make sure that I don't have any games on my plate for Astrobot dropping on the 6th of September. Because Astro's Playroom was this incredible tech demo, and now they're, like, taking it to the next logical conclusion. And that's exciting. And then Yars Rising and Rugrats Adventures in Gameland. Like, there's a stacked list of releases for September. (laughs) And I have too many games to complete uh, in order to feel good about that. (laughs) <laughs> right, so so we're going to hear that. And then also, once we finish recording this episode, I'm going to talk to Seijin about what I might be doing for level, for, ep- for level, for episode 400 of the Say Report. And w- if that happens to be what happens, everybody's going to be like, Devin, you're a damn fool. Why did you do this to yourself? <laughs> but that's enough for now um, from me. Anything else that you want to make sure we talk about, Seijin? Oh, before. We'll see you all next week. Yeah, thank you so much for stopping by at the Say Report. Uh, if you want to join in on the conversation, you can join us in the Discord. If you go to any of our social media pages on Facebook or X, formerly Twitter, uh, I guess unless you're in Brazil, right? Twitter just shut down in Brazil. It's possible, folks, right? All you TikTok people, like, how could they do that? Brazil just just showed us how they can do that. So I don't know, but but we're still on there, right? Uh, so Facebook or X, formerly Twitter, you go to the Say Report and you can see an invite to join us in the Discord. Um, if you're old school, though, you can just send an email to thesayreport at gmail.com and we can hook you up with an invite that way. And if you're like too shy to join the Discord, which I completely understand if that is the case, uh, then just go and uh, talk to us via email. And if it's specifically for Seijin or myself, just put our name in the subject line and our non-existent intern will be sure to divvy it up as proper so that I don't see any of your words that are meant for Seijin's eyes only. I understand that. Um, as a reminder, we did just release a very special episode. I'm bringing it on again. And that episode was weird, but we didn't touch on the craziest thing about that episode. Uh, No, we did. No, we did. We talked about 3 to Tango and um, the thing. It still blows my mind that the director of 3 to Tango directed Bring It On Again. (laughs) Um, So much so that I thought we'd never touched on it. Um, So if you're interested in that, that's there. And also, Adam Sandler Cinematic Universe Podcast. Uh, We got an episode coming up very shortly. Uh, because Adam's birthday's coming up. so uh, And it's Grown Ups 2 if you are trying to stay up to date on that and you're joining us on the Say Report. So make sure you watch Grown Ups 2 before the next episode of the Adam and Sandler Cinematic Universe podcast. But that's everything from us. And one less Baba Booey thing, Seijin. Come on, say it. <laughs> Baba Booey? There you go. All right, well, now you can bring us home. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your host, Devin Decker and Seijin Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.